Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Vocabulary. Learning vocabulary. Actively learning vocabulary. Of course, you know, there are basically two levels of learning for vocabulary. What we might call passive and active. Passive means you understand the word when you hear it or when you see it. Passive vocabulary. Active vocabulary means you can actually use the word correctly. That's more difficult. Now, we're live on Facebook today. Hello to everyone joining and saying hello. Hello, hello, hello. I love you guys too. Best teacher ever. Thank you very much. Every day I listen to you in my car. Great. Hello from Vietnam. Hello, how are you? Dalal again. Hey, doing well. Kind of fun on the live shows. I get to see a lot of the same names coming back. And a lot of you guys ask a lot of really good questions. And so it's good. We have our regular viewers, our regular listeners to the Effortless English Show. You guys know how this works. In the beginning, I talk about a topic so those of you watching live, relax, relax, relax. You're getting relaxed. After I finish talking about the topic, later in the show, I will come and I will read your comments and questions and we'll have a little discussion. So hello, Brazil and Afghanistan and Kurdistan and Myanmar and all the places you're saying hello from. All right, let's talk about this. Vocabulary. So active and passive vocabulary. Passive means you understand it when you hear it or see it. That's easier, much easier. And active means you can actually use it correctly when you speak or write. Much more difficult. Why is it more difficult? One of the reasons is that words have two kinds of meaning. I don't mean they have two definitions. Some, some words do have many meanings, of course, you know that. No, I mean, even for one meaning of a word, there are two levels. That's a good way to say it. There are two levels of meaning for each and every word. And with a lot of words, these two levels of meaning can be quite different and very important. And we have a name, we have a, a, a linguistic name for these two levels of meaning. One is called denotation, and the other is called connotation. Denotation and connotation, they're the two levels of meaning of any vocabulary word. Denotation, connotation. You don't really need to remember those words, I'm just telling you. So what are they? Let's talk about the two levels. The surface level. The most obvious level is the denotation. That's the dictionary definition of the word. You go to the dictionary, you look it up, it gives you the meaning of the word. It's, we also say that's the literal, literal, meaning direct, meaning of a word. It's denotation. That's the first level, the obvious level. That's the level you always study when you're studying vocabulary, when you're using a dictionary, when you're buying all those vocabulary books and trying to memorize vocabulary, which you should not do, but I know you do it sometimes. That's the denotation. It's useful. For sure it's useful, especially for passive learning of vocabulary, just to understand it, just to understand the word when you hear it and see it. You know, learning that denotation, that surface level, that's fine. That's okay. It's necessary. It's useful. However, to use a word well and correctly, you need to also know the deeper level of the word. That's its connotation. 
It's connotation. What is the connotation? What is that? It's, there's different ways we could say it, but it's basically the feeling of the word. Sometimes I call it the flavor of the word. Some people say the vibration of the word. Some, might, some people might say the taste, the taste of the word. It depends on which sense you want to talk about. The vibration, the color of the word, the taste of the word. It's kind of, it's emotional quality. It's emotional quality. It's deep meaning. It's deep root meaning. And sometimes that's not super clear or obvious. It's sometimes you don't quite get that from the dictionary. So how do you learn that? That's, that's a little more tough. It's not, it's, it's the indirect meaning. It's not direct. It's not what's written in the dictionary. But that connotation is very important because the connotation tells you when should you use that word? In what situations do we use that word? And which situations do we not use that word? And what emotional feeling and subtle, meaning not clear, indirect, meaning are you giving with that word? You need all of that to actively use it and use it correctly. That's much more difficult. Let's do an example. It's an example from my Twitter and it's an example from my audio podcast. Two words, enthusiasm and passion. A few days ago, I did, a, I did an audio podcast where I talked about these two words, enthusiasm and passion. And I talked about the fact that I used to say passion, passion, passion a lot. I used to use that word passion quite often. Kind of imitating Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins uses this word, live with passion, he says. Because passion, at the very surface level, it's denotation level, it's surface level. The, the basic meaning is, you know, is a kind of excitement. It's a basically strong emotion, strong emotion. So live with passion means live with strong emotion. Seems okay. Seems like, a, yeah, you know, gives the image, gives the idea, live with passion of, of excitement. Yeah, yeah. And then enthusiasm, at that same level, the surface level, the denotation, also has a similar idea of, of being excited, really excited, this excited feeling about something. In fact, let's go. We can look in the dictionary right now. I got them both on here. Let's look them up. Online dictionary. All right, so in the online dictionary, we got enthusiasm, the definition of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm and a strong excitement of feeling. Strong excitement of feeling. Right? Okay. What about passion? Well, there are a few old meanings of the word, but basically it says um, strong emotions. Strong emotions. Ardent. It can also have a like be connected to love and things like that. Love and and uh, sexual desire. That's one meaning of passion. But another more general one, the one Tony Robbins is using, is this kind of, is again, strong emotion. So at that basic level, they seem very similar. What about the deeper level? The deeper level, where, does, where do these meanings come from? The, the connotation, the emotional feeling of a word, the deep meaning of a word, where does that come from? If it's not in the dictionary, how do we know it? How do we learn it? Two things. Number one, it comes from how we use it, the situations, the, the common phrases, the common situations where we use it. Over time, after you hear the word many, many times in lots of these different situations, then you'll begin to understand that deeper meaning and flavor of the word, the vibration of the word. And the second place we can find that connotation is the history of the word, its roots, right? Because in English, with English words, English is a newer language, but it came from where? Well, it came from Latin, French, and then Latin, French more recently, and Latin going back even farther, and also Germanic, right? Germanic, which also can circle back to Latin. But 
these kind of Germanic and French and Latin, you know, right? These roots, Old English. So we can look back at the root, like where do these words come from? And then we can get a feeling of, ah, why, this is why one word has a different feeling than another word, because, because in the past they had much more different meanings. And that is true with these two words. And a great one uh, on kind of summarizing what I said on my podcast, Ciro here from, I'm not sure where you're from actually, Ciro, sorry. Let me see if I, if on your comment, uh, I don't know. Oh, Italy, Italia, of course. So you, a very, Italian has a very strong roots and connection to Latin, of course. So he sums this up very well. Enthusiasm and passion. I'm reading his tweet right now. Every single word has a different vibration. He's using the word vibration, right? The original Latin root. Right? So we go back, we look at the Latin root, the old, old, old meaning of enthusiasm. What does it come from? It comes from in theos. In theos. What does that mean? In, like inside. Theos meaning divine or God. Ah, in God. Ooh. So literally, meaning that in the past, it, it, the, the denotation, the meaning was the divine, the godly power within. Right? Christians might call that, you know, the Holy Spirit within you. Wow, so that gives a very different meaning than just excitement. A much deeper, much, much deeper meaning for enthusiasm, if we look at the root and the history of that word. And then passion also has a deep root. Passion originally meant and here again, Ciro, with a great, great explanation, it was a passion, the word passion, was originally related to suffering, suffering for something outside of us. Some, suffering for something outside. So, wow, now you see, like, so in our modern nowadays, these... We look in the dictionary, they seem not so far apart. They seem kind of similar. Excitement, strong emotion. But when we look at the history of the word, suddenly very, very different. One means in God, you know, filled with the spirit of God. And the other one means suffering for something. Very, very, very different. So this gives these two words through the history. Or somehow we have this memory of it in the way we use these words, where we can start to feel out this, this different feeling of the word. This is, and this is, you know, this is why poets, people who write poetry, or great artists, great writers, why they choose one word instead of another word. So there might be many words that have close to the same meaning, but the writer will choose one because the writer is going for that deep emotion of that word, its connotation. It's emotional vibration or flavor. So as I was saying, I've decided, uh, as I was saying in the podcast, the audio podcast, I have decided to use the word enthusiasm instead of passion. Because, uh, yeah, I realize that actually when, I, when I'm talking about this kind of excitement and this kind of feeling, that I'm, I actually am not talking about passion. I'm not talking about suffering. I'm not talking about, um, you know, seeking some kind of physical pleasure. I'm talking about enthusiasm, a kind of, of happiness and um, joy, same, same idea, that does not come from physical pleasure. It comes from something much deeper. That's, where, that's the root of enthusiasm. And that's what I'm talking about, to have enthusiasm for your life, to have enthusiasm when you're learning English. It's not connected to suffering and it's not connected to some kind of physical pleasure. It's connected to more of this, of a deeper happiness, a deeper feeling of excitement and happiness and gratitude. So enthusiasm is actually a much better word to describe what I'm trying to say. See, and this is where you really become a master of English when you start to get this deeper level of the vocabulary. Just be patient. How do you get that deeper level? A lot of reading and a lot of listening.
You can't get it from a book. You can't memorize it. There, no one's going to explain this. I guess you could study Latin if you want to learn a whole other language. But really the best and easiest way is you just have to read, 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 read a lot. So you'll see these words again and again in, these, in certain situations. And you'll just start to, again, naturally get and understand more of the deeper feeling of the word. And you'll get better and better and better at using it well. Because this is really an art. It's not a science. It's an art. And this art takes time. So you need to be patient about that. Now, the good news is you don't need to know that deep level so much just to understand. The other good news is to communicate clearly for just normal communication, not artistic communication, but just good, strong, direct, effective communication. You can just use common, simple words. That's all you need. So... When we're talking about connotation and these deeper meanings and the emotional meaning of words, that is very, very advanced. And at a, at a, like I said, at an almost artistic level of speaking English and using English, you will get it. You will start to learn that as you go forward, but it does take a lot of time. Don't get stressed about it. Don't worry about it. Focus on speaking clearly, directly, using simple words and let your passive vocabulary grow and grow and grow from lots of listening and lots of reading. All right. Let's take a look at the comments and questions now. Hmm. Lots of people just saying hello. So you, I'll take comments and questions now. Ah, I see. Um, so let's see. When is saying, I might see clearly the difference between enthusiasm and passion just by translating them to my language, Vietnamese. Possibly. Sometimes a translation dictionary might give you the right feeling, and it might not. I think um, in this case, romance languages, you know, uh, Latin languages basically have a, a big advantage because so many words of English have their roots in Latin and, you know, French, Italian, for example, Spanish, they're, they're much more closely connected to Latin. So I think that, that, that those people who speak those languages probably get the feeling of the words actually much faster. It's harder, like for a Japanese person, Japanese and English, you know, Japanese is not connected to Latin, so they're not going to get that same deeper meaning quickly. That's okay. Again, it's nothing you don't need to get stressed about it. Okay. Maybe I should learn Latin, Christian Long says. Yeah, you know, there, there, well, let's talk about that, actually. Christian Long, Long Christian says, maybe I should learn Latin. It's actually not a bad idea. You know, Latin, if you look back at the, the education system before our horrible, modern, terrible schools, what, what we might call classic education, so looking back, you know, hundreds of years, of what and I'm talking about Western, so European, American, um, and North and South American and European education systems traditionally did teach Latin. Everybody did learn Latin in school or at home, homeschooling. So Latin was considered, you know, one of the core, most important subjects. This is why. This is why, because it's the root language of, of European languages. And understanding Latin gives you a better understanding of English, a deeper understanding of English. And if you learn Latin, you also can much more easily learn any other European languages, but especially Italian, French, Spanish. So, you know, of course, you know, the, the, from practically we think, well, I don't know, nobody speaks Latin now. But... Um, there actually are some good arguments for studying Latin, for sure. 
I, you know, I never learned it myself because they, they sort of stopped focusing on that in schools. But I, maybe a mistake. Maybe we should all be learning Latin. And, of course, you know, for Europeans and uh, Western people in general, Latin is one of, you know, Latin and Greek are really our, the two foundation languages of our civilizations, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. So they're good arguments for learning both of those languages. Okay, how can I the English? Okay, let's see, Emmanuel again. Uh, how can I know the meaning of each new words that I come across in a book or link? Steve Kaufman's site, yes. Because um, most new words cannot be found in a regular dictionary. What do you recommend? There an app where native speakers explain which words you don't know. So if a word's not in a dictionary, if there's a word that you can't find in a dictionary, it probably means it's some kind of slang. Because, you know, any common words will be found in dictionaries. So then it means slang or your dictionary is not good enough and you need maybe a better dictionary. That's possible. Some dictionaries are quite small. They're not great. So, but, but some, like I was just using, what was it, Merriam-Webster online that that's a pretty big one so you know the really big ones should have all the the, the re, quote, real words you know the common words of english so if you find something that's not in one of those dictionaries it may be slang and it is indeed difficult then how do you figure out the meaning of slang that can be tough so they do have slang there's something called the urban dictionary that sometimes is a good one for slang Urban is called the Urban Dictionary. It's online. Uh, probably UrbanDictionary.com. Let me look really quickly. Let's just type in here and see. Urban Dictionary. Yeah, UrbanDictionary.com for slang, slang words and phrases. So that's a good possibility. Check out UrbanDictionary.com if you're if you're not finding something in a normal dictionary. Maybe it's slang, a slang word or a slang phrase where you could um, find it there instead. Can we use flashcards to use to learn vocabulary? You can. I'm, I find them a little boring, but you can if you want to. Really, reading is the best way, as I've said many times. Some words have different meanings depending on the situation we use them. Also correct, Dalal. Yes, that's right. This is another challenge, <laughs> right? Some words have uh, many different meanings depending on the situation. This, that, of course, that makes that can be difficult too. And as you know, also some words have the same pronunciation, but they they're spelled differently depending on the meaning. Like there is the famous one, right? Three different ways to spell there, 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 and there. They're all pronounced exactly the same, but they're spelled differently depending on the meaning. They are, or their possession, or their like location or something. It's all part of the fun challenge of learning English. Don't get stressed about it. Do your best. What's Muhammad asking? What's the most, hi, sir, what's the most important thing to not miss the meaning of words? Hmm. I think just focusing, concentration. You just have to concentrate and focus, you know, pay attention to the situation where the word is used. And also just realize sometimes you'll be guessing and you won't know for sure. And that's okay, too. Right. You know, you, sometimes they're just words you don't know. That's you can't avoid that. So many times, especially in speech, when you're listening, you, you'll hear and you, you won't catch a word or you'll hear, hear a word. You don't know what it means. You just do your best to guess. You can ask somebody if you've got the time, you could say, well, what'd you say? What, what does that word mean? You could do that if you want. But if if it's a lot of words, then you don't want to interrupt too much. 
So, just guess. Do your best. And you have to be a little patient, too, which is hard, right? But you do have to be patient because, you know, I... There are all these different studies that people have diff say different things. But, you know, basically you need to hear a word many times before you learn it completely. One time is not enough. If you hear a new word one time, even if you ask somebody the meaning, you're going to forget it. You will forget, okay, after the first time. Just, that's just that's how your brain works. You'll forget. And probably the second time you'll forget and the third time you'll forget and the fourth time you'll forget. So don't get, there's no reason to get stressed or upset by it because that's completely 100% normal. Uh, that's the normal situation. It just takes repetition. Every skill, everything we learn in life requires some amount of repetition. And that's the same, that's basically the same answer to this question, which is uh, from Tin Dung. How to remember vocabulary longer, and I can remember the sound, but I cannot remember the words when I write it down. So it's the same idea. You need repetition. Repetition, repetition. Flashcards give repetition, but the problem is flash, flashcards don't have context. They don't, they're not, there's no situation or meaning there in the, in the flashcard or the vocabulary list. Same problem, which is why reading works better and listening too. You know, it's a real situation. It's a real context, right? So you're getting the word and, and it's surrounded and it's not used in its natural way, connected to lots of other ideas and emotions and images and things. That's the best way. Hi, I have a bad memory. That's ah, okay. Just keep reading. Okay, Jocelyn asking, uh, good morning, teacher. I'm from the Philippines. Hello to you. I understand well in English, but my big problem is speaking and pronunciation is terrible. How can I improve my speaking and my pronunciation? Thank you. Uh, look at my YouTube channel. I've got a few videos about pronunciation. My YouTube is AJ Hogue, A-J-H-O-G-E. Or you can go to my website, Effortless English Club. Go to the blog, either one. But I've got some vid videos about pronunciation. I have a pronunciation course on my website also, EffortlessEnglishClub.com. So the pronunciation course, you know, it's a training pronunciation to improve. The other thing you can do is, you know, listen carefully and try to imitate. Try to every day, you know, you play a sentence, pause, imitate. Play the next sentence, pause, imitate. Play the next sentence, pause, imitate. Noting, noticing as carefully as possible the native speaker's pronunciation and then trying to copy it as you speak. That's the basic process. Yeah, so here's Hasina saying, Basically what I just said, giving you a testimonial. Athena says, I read books every day. It helps me a lot with my vocab and grammar. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. All right, Bahish. I'm still having the problem with words not getting out when writing an exam. Uh, well, first of all, that's an unnatural situation. Uh, it's been a long time since it happened. I thought it would be fixed one day, but no. I'm sick of and tired of it. Am I beyond saving? No, but you have to realize, you know, for writing for school exams is, ugh. yeah, it's completely unnatural. It's not natural communication. So, you're probably trying to force yourself to use vocabulary actively that you don't know actively. You don't know well enough. As I said at the beginning of this show, to use vocabulary is much more difficult than just to understand it. This is why I say, you know, speak with simple vocabulary. Well, the same advice for writing. Write with simple vocabulary. There's no reason to use complicated, difficult vocabulary. If you don't know something really, really, really well, like completely understand that word. If you don't, don't use it in speech. Don't use it when you write, especially for something important, like an exam or something. Just use simple words. Communicate simply and directly using simple vocabulary. 
You can say everything you need to using common, simple words. I think people, I mean, there's nothing wrong with using other words, but I think people try to force it too much. They think, I don't know why. They think, oh, I gotta, I've gotta, I must use this word. I know it, therefore I must use it. And just, maybe they think they need it to sound intelligent. Maybe it's the school systems pushing you to do this, you know, because you get a better score if you use these difficult words. I don't know what it is, but it's not necessary, is my point. There's no need to create pressure and stress about it. Let the word, use the words that naturally come to your mind quickly and easily. Don't try to force yourself, oh no, I must use this word because it's, I don't know, more complicated or more advanced or more intellectual. Not necessary. And usually, here's the thing, when you push yourself, you try to force yourself to use that difficult word that you don't know so well, I guarantee you're probably using it wrong. How can I guarantee this? I can guarantee this because I used to teach in a school, a language school, and every time I gave an assignment, I had, you know, I asked my students to write something. So not some, not something like uh, about economic theory, not, nothing complicated. I just say, write about what you did yesterday or, you know, write about your favorite hobbies back home in your country. You know, simple, simple conversational topics. And oh my goodness, so many, almost all of the students, they would be trying to use these big, long, complicated sentences and trying to use these big TOEFL vocabulary words. They thought they were, you know, writing well and effectively, but the truth is they had no idea how to use those words well. They did not have the connotations. They didn't understand the connotations. And so, in fact, they thought they were writing well by using all this complicated stuff. That's what the school taught them. But the truth is the writing was horrible. And when I say horrible, I mean many, 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 many times I would get the paper and I could not, I had no idea what they're talking about. I could not figure out just basically what is the topic of this paper. That's how bad it was. It was so complicated, so the vocabulary was used so badly that I couldn't understand anything. I mean, it was all English, but I, I was, what are they trying to say? I, I, it was hard for me as a teacher. My, my job as a teacher would be to, you know, to correct it and to give some advice, but it was so bad that I, I couldn't even think of advice. All I could think was, uh, oh man, we got to start from zero. <laughs> I've got to teach them how to write from nothing because they have no idea. The school has destroyed their ability to write. Big mistake. It would, it, they would have written much more clearly and better if they had just used the very simple words that they usually used when they talked because those students, it was a, like a high intermediate class. They could talk. They could speak in English fairly well. They could communicate fairly well. I could talk to them. If I ask them talking about that topic, well, what did you do yesterday? They could tell me using simple sentences, simple words, very clear. I, I could understand exactly what they were saying. So they had no problem communicating when they were speaking. But suddenly I asked them to write it and they, com like they com became completely different people and now they're trying to use, you know, these long, 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 long sentences and I must use the big, big, big words. And it was horrible horrible so i would i just constantly tell them write how you talk write how you speak it's a little different of course a little more the rules are a little stricter right? a little tougher for writing got to be a little more careful about the punctuation but basically at a you know for your mindset your basic attitude when you're writing is to write the way you speak because probably your speaking is much better than your writing when you speak, you probably speak directly. You probably use clear sentences, simple sentences, and you probably use simpler vocabulary that you actually really know and really understand. That's what you should do when you write. Don't try to suddenly change into someone completely different just because you're writing. So this is one of the big challenges of writing. And here's another, you know, when it also brings up 
That's also true. I can't write for exams even in my language because those exams probably, they're not what I want to write about. Yes, that's another good point and another problem with schools, right? Because they say, they give you some topic that you, you, you have no idea about, you don't care about at all. So this also makes it a big challenge because you're like, uh, what do I write? I don't, uh. And then you try to sound intellectual. I must sound intellectual because this is an exam. And so it creates a very unnatural and, in truth, confusing and terrible style of communication. This is why, you know, I always make the comment that professors are terrible writers. Because it's, it's not just students. They're learning this from their professors in school. And it's because their professors also try to write this way. And they also are terrible writers. They're terrible, most of them. Most of them can't write at all. They're so horrible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ask them about phrasal verbs. You just lose you. Someone asked me about how do you learn phrasal verbs. Same way you learn all other vocabulary, and that's just from situations. You know, you see it in reading, you hear it in writing. I mean, hear it in speaking, and it's just repetition. You know, getting it from natural situations. That's the key for phrasal verbs, getting them. All right, I think that's about it. One more. Okay, so kind of related. Baban says, what's the best way to use new words that I have learned while I'm not because when I'm not from an English-speaking country. Again, don't force yourself to use words. There's no particular reason you must force yourself to use a word. Now, of course, when you're a beginner, you, can't, you almost have to do this because you're, you're just learning and you don't, even know, you, you don't even know the simple word, right? The most common word is new for you. So just to communicate, you, you, if you're trying to talk, if you must communicate, then of course, yes, you're, you're going to have to force yourself a bit. But do your best. Don't, don't get stressed about it. Make mistakes. Don't worry about the grammar too much in the beginning. Just, you know, use bad grammar. It's okay. But later at the level, I already know that because you're listening to me now, I already know you're at least intermediate level. So at your level, you know the common vocabulary, right? You know the most of the vocabulary I'm using right now. So there's no need to force yourself to use other words just because you learn them. It's just, it's, there's nothing wrong. It's totally fine to have a lot of words that are passive, to know a lot of words passively that you know them, you hear them, you know them, you understand them, you see them when you're reading, you understand them, but you never ever use them when you speak. That's totally fine. That's, in fact, that's normal. I'm exactly the same way. My passive vocabulary in English is huge. I read a lot. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of words that I know very well when I see them in reading or hear them. But I almost never, or in some cases, never use them when I'm speaking or writing. Because usually when I'm writing or speaking, if I have a choice between the most common word and some word that's very, very uncommon, I will use the common word. Now, if I was an artist, if I was writing literature, right? If I was trying to write the next war and peace. If I was a poet trying to write beautiful poetry, then perhaps I would use one of these less common words because I want that perfect flavor, that perfect deep, deep meaning of the word, that perfect emotion. But in normal, everyday conversation, in most of the communication we do, including writing, I don't need to be that careful or artistic or emotional. So I just use the common word, the most common everyday word. It works almost all the time. And for you, that's all you need most of the time. In fact, I'd say almost all the time. 
So there's just no reason. Don't force yourself to use new words just because you learned it. Just because you learned it, you don't have to use it. It's not necessary. Okay. You know where to go for my VIP program. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. You know, one thing about my VIP program is that I focus on those common words to get you using that common everyday English, the phrases, the grammar, the vocabulary, well to master that common vocabulary, to master that conversational level of English and at advanced level. So that's why I use so much repetition in the Effortless English system, in all my courses, including VIP. Repetition, repetition, repetition to get it go deeper, deeper, deeper. So you just use those words and phrases and grammar, everything automatically, automatically, without thinking, without translating, automatically. That requires repetition and training. So join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Nice talking to you. See you tomorrow.